I think you have to do those things. Hello and welcome to the Michael Harding podcast. The Little Buddha Corner. I think I call it the Buddha Corner. Because in my studio I have a bookcase and it's full of Christian icons. But I also have a little corner where I have a shrine to the Buddha. On the top of the shrine, there's a a little image of Manjushri. He's the Buddha of Wisdom. And there's two Buddhas that are kind of fundamental. One is Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of Compassion. And the other one is Manjushri, who's the Buddha of Wisdom. And there, if you like, two major pillars... And wisdom and love are two pillars in every religion. You know, it's it's the two great wells that you draw from in your own life. If you draw from the well of wisdom and you draw from the well of compassion, you'll have a happy life. You'll have a happy day. Wisdom requires going inside, going into your own interior and finding the way that in stillness and in mindfulness you gather what they call realizations. You just get insight. It just comes to you by simply being and by being present and paying attention, turning up. Here I am, Lord, used to be a great prayer. Here I am, Lord. Like like you turn up. Like God is waiting for you all the time and every so often, maybe every morning or every day, you turn up, you show up. Here I am. And that's what you do to find wisdom. And at some stage... I think if you're doing mindfulness, you will find your own threshold over which, across which you will go to find wisdom. You know, you can, you can find mindfulness and it's, it's a tactic, it's a skill, it's a craft, it's a a way of paying attention to the present moment. Here you are, and this is your body, and here are the thoughts going through your mind. So so mindfulness does that for us, but I think there's another step required, and that is moving over the threshold into presence. Presence, as Martin Buber would say, the great sort of ontological other, the way that you experience yourself not as alone, but in relationship with another a downness in the universe, a kind of a sense of a being, a presence that you can speak to in the second person, you. And you can say, here I am, Lord. And you can be present with that, and if you are, you know that you've gone over a threshold. And this happens in Buddhism as well because it's where the threshold is between self and that great moment of insight that all Buddhist traditions talk about and that's the non-existence of self. So in mindfulness you're holding together a sense of yourself but yet the threshold is Beyond that, in Buddhist terms, it is beyond it. It's, it's the well of being where you begin to awaken to Buddha mind. That's why in Buddhism there's so much emphasis on renunciation. Because any little bit of renunciation, any little bit of fasting or you know, disciplining, 
your mind begins to allow you to see where you are. And renunciation is a difficult word in any religion. And it's certainly a difficult word for me because I have lived my life more as a hedonist than as somebody renouncing the world. I remember when I used to go to Loch Derg as a teenager and there was a point during the rituals you would stand in front of a particular stone in the wall of the basilica and you would stretch your arms out three times as you renounced uh, what was it, the flesh, the devil, the world, the flesh and the devil. And I couldn't keep a straight face doing it. So renunciation didn't mean much to me then and over the years it hasn't meant much to me since. I do I do feel it's valuable because I have found that life is actually about renunciation. You know, that the wisdom that I find when I go inside, when I go to the well of, of wisdom, when I try to be still and then I begin to slip over a threshold of, of, of listening, of attention, and feel that I am in the presence of God. And I think now come the realizations about the nature of my short life. And the realization that comes is that you're losing things all the time. Life is impermanent, so your good health or your youth or your energy or your wealth, nothing lasts. And so, so renunciation is only a kind of a, an exercise in what's going to happen anyway. And if you want to be happy as you're growing old, it, it's a question of being graceful and letting go. There's nothing worse than watching an old person who is still clinging to the idea of wanting to be a young person. So that's the way that I learned renunciation. I learned it the hard way. There's a great Jungian idea which Tom McIntyre was very fond of quoting, and that, that is, those who will not be led will be dragged. You know, the idea that, that there's a kind of a natural evolution of our, of our conscious being in the world, that it already has a definitive shape to it, and it reveals itself. And that idea is very close to the Buddhist idea of karmic imprint, that, you know, a karmic action creates an imprint in your conscious mind that is easy to repeat the same action. So in that sense, if you are born into the world and in that moment it is the manifestation or the incarnation of of the karmic shape that that you have before you're born, well, of course, sometimes your life is a process of that karmic shape revealing itself. So renunciation becomes a way of putting on the brake, a way of kind of stopping the natural flow of who you are based on a deeper level of who you want to be. And even if you're like me and you spend your life being lazy and drinking too much and eating too much and indulging yourself all the way, you can still find a kind of wisdom and a peace and a serenity in just the process of aging. The very process that you would think was the worst thing in your life becomes the best thing in your life. You would imagine that if you were young and healthy and in the full of your health and you had money and, and you were energetic, then, well, that's it. You'd love to be like that all the time and, 
and therefore aging seems to be a treachery of the of your body pulling you down and that's the way most people look upon old age aging is like the decline of somebody but in Buddhist terms, in terms of renunciation, it's every day is an opportunity to let go a little more of who you were. And that's surrendering all the time to the aging process or surrendering to who you are deep inside because the aging process is, is kind of tearing away all the ways that you were alive as a young person seems to me that that's a very good natural inbuilt form of renunciation so we may not we, ne we may not be led but we will be dragged it's saying that we may not have a natural propensity to experience or to exercise renunciation but you know something your life is about renunciation it is the inevitable consequence and I always know, and I'm just <coughs> going to stop here for a second because I'm making noise at the microphone. And, uh, and, and now the, the noise is over. But <coughs> I, always, I always notice that, you know, when somebody is, is very ill and they're near death, there's sometimes a moment where people will say to them to let go. You know, that in, in the last hours or minutes of somebody's life, there's still a sense of holding on. And somebody who loves them can, can say very, very eloquently and beautifully that it's time to let go. And not to be afraid. Not to be afraid of what the abyss of emptiness and nothingness means or is, but just surrender. And surrender in the way that you might surrender to a loving mother or to God. Let go. So that's the kind of a way that renunciation is there all the time. And renunciation is a big part to play in this whole Buddhist stuff. But you have something to console you, and that is that I'm, I wouldn't have a good reputation as somebody who practices renunciation. And that brings me to another point. I wouldn't have a good reputation as being a Buddhist. I wouldn't have a good reputation of being a Christian. And I'm I'm definitely not a teacher of Buddhist practice. I don't know how I can come to you in relation to the idea of Buddhist teachings. I think that the best way I can do it is to say that I'm sharing with you as a friend and I'm sharing my experience. And I will gradually try to refer to Lamrim teachings, which are the essential teachings of the Galukpa school of Tibetan Buddhism and they are the teachings that my teacher the Panchen Utsul Rinpoche was brought up with and teaches and is a master of and this is one of the big things about you know the Lamrim teachings always begin with a kind of a logical or rational focusing on the value of the teachings and where they came from and what i'll do is i'll just i'll just read you if i can find it here um I, i'll read you what they call the preliminaries and this is what you focus on before you actually get into the teachings of Buddhism in Lamrim in Tibetan Buddhist practice and the preliminaries are these you start off by contemplating the greatness of the authors 
given to show the teaching has an immaculate source. So it'd be like if I'm talking to you about Lam Rim teachings, well then I would talk to you, let's say, about a particular book. And there's a great book called Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand, but there's other books by Robert Thurman and there's books by the Dalai Lama and they all give, you know, the Lam Rim teachings. And so you'd be looking at the book itself and you'd be saying, this is an impeccable source. Right, this is a very high Lama and this guy knows what he's talking about and and that's where you start. And you go back to Atisha. You always go back to Atisha in this tradition because Atisha was a great philosopher of India and of Buddhist tradition and he was invited to Tibet in the ninth century and he, he went to Tibet and then when he was in Tibet he wrote a book called The Lamp for the Path and he wrote it for the people in Tibet so that it would help them practice Buddhism. And that book, because he was an impeccable master and he was coming directly out of the Indian tradition of Buddhist monastic society, so he's a real link with the original Buddha. And then he's he's writing the book, it's not as if he wrote the book for Indians and then it was read in Tibet, but he actually comes to Tibet and writes a book for Tibetan people to practice. And then that book becomes the foundation of Buddha's practice in Tibet. And in the 14th century, you're talking like the start of the 15th century, end of the 14th century, there was a big, important philosopher, monk, a lama, called Tsongkhapa. And he did a whole new job of clarifying the great book by Atisha and sharpening it with his own commentaries so that when he dies in 1419, he leaves a whole volume of books that are based on Atisha's book. And when you're studying something about Tibetan Buddhism, you go to a teacher, the teacher's going to be using a manuscript, like he's not making it up as he goes along, he's not giving his opinions, it's not kind of some sort of fashionable, oh, this is what I had a thought about this morning and being original. He's simply passing on the teachings. And the teachings, whatever script he's coming out of, whatever book he's using, will have a lineage that goes back to the work of Tsongkhapa and that goes back from Tsongkhapa to Atisha and from Atisha, of course, it goes back to the Buddha. And in that way, you're establishing the greatness of the authors to show that the teaching you're getting has an immaculate source. And if you don't get that, you're in the wrong shop. So they would say. So don't pick your Buddhism up in any old shop and don't go to the bazaar. You know the way if you wanted a good Apple computer, you would go to an Apple shop. And you wouldn't buy it from somebody on the street. Or you wouldn't buy it from somebody if there was no Apple logo on the front of it and they said, ah, no, it's an Apple machine. And you'd say, but there's no Apple logo. And, ah, it doesn't matter, it's an Apple machine. You, you go to the real shop and you get the real thing. And in the same way, this is one of the biggest things that I, I feel is important about Buddhism. And I feel the same, to be honest with you, about Christianity. Go to the shop. Go to the original. 
go to, I mean, my preferences in Christianity, obviously I'm born and reared and ordained in the Roman Catholic tradition. That's my home, that's my base, that's my root. But I also deeply revere and, and feel alive in the Orthodox Church. And I have had great moments with Reformation churches. But I'd always I'd always be careful, I suppose, to stick within some kind of mainstream. I wouldn't really make it up on my own. And even though I live an independent life and I live outside any institutional church and I believe that in some sense there's a need of for all of us in the West to sort of reimagine Christianity. And I believe that in the way that I live outside the church institutionally, and yet I I celebrate my faith, in, in some sense I'm an exile from the institutional church. But that doesn't mean that I would like to reimagine the church any way I feel like it, or any way. I would always keep going back to the sources, keep going back to the original. And Tibetan Buddhism is, is very clear, very strong about that. So the first thing you need is a teacher. Now, I'm not a teacher. I'm nowhere near a teacher. I'm, I'm like a spiritual friend who's sharing with you my experience that might stimulate you to go and get a teacher. But when you then do go to get a teacher... Don't be wasting your time with somebody who is only standing on their own authority or who is sort of moshing up and mashing up the, the teachings with all sorts of other uh, aspects of modernity. Go to a teacher within the tradition. If it's Islam, then go to the right person. If it's Christianity, if it's Buddhism, and in, in these talks we're talking about Buddhism, we're talking about Tibetan Buddhism, you need a, a Tibetan Lama who is recognized, he or she is recognized within the tradition as an, an important, valuable teacher who's ordained as a teacher and so on and so forth. There's one of them in Kavan, in Jampaling, and there's, there's others in Samiling in Scotland. And the great thing about the internet is that you can access teachings and teachers on YouTube or going to websites and, and subscribing and and being able to connect with and follow really authoritative teachers. For example, in Christianity, there's a person, Cynthia Borgo, uh, whom, who I follow, subscribe to, and therefore I can access uh, teachings and meditations that she does on the Internet. And and it's just a wonderful time for this. It's a wonderful time to, to find such amazing stuff on the internet. Everybody talks about what's bad on the internet, but there's an awful lot of good stuff. Anyway, the very first thing about Buddhism is find a teacher and find one who is authoritative, that they are teaching from a text that you can check is an authoritative text and that has a, a lineage that goes back to Tsongkhapa, goes back from Tsongkhapa to Atisha. You're, you're talking about the mainstream. And it's really interesting that those two things are the first things that are emphasized in Tibetan Buddhism. Find a teacher, find a teacher that teaches properly from the right sources. Um, there's something about the, the logic of that and the rationalism involved in that which kind of alerts me immediately to the nature of Buddhism. Because in all the other religions, you could say that they are revealed religions, that there is usually a holy scripture that contains the revelation of God Certainly that's true in the Abrahamic tradition of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. You get this sense that 
there's a revelation from God in the text. And Buddhism is fundamentally different because there is no such revelation. There is no such holy scripture that can reveal to you instantly the will of God or or bring you to enlightenment like, oh, because you read this sacred scripture. And it means that what Buddhism is emphasizing is logic and rational examination and analysis of your own experience and measuring that against various texts that are coming to you from the mainstream. So you get the mainstream right, you get the sources of the the text that you're reading, you say, is this really mainstream Tibetan Buddhism? Let's say you take up Robert Thorman and you say, well, is this really, is this guy, he's an American, he's alive, he lives in New York, professor in Harvard or somewhere. And you say to yourself, well, like, is this guy for real? You know, is he is he part of the mainstream? He's not wearing robes. He doesn't have the big yellow hat, so he doesn't look like the Dalai Lama. So is he a, is he a, a good source? And you, you do the inquiry yourself. You, you look at what is the text that he's teaching on and where does that come from? And if you do that, you'll be amazed at how the main good teachers will usually be working out of the main texts. The Lamp for the Path by Atisha will come up again and again and again as the source you know, you might be reading a book that has a, you know, a new title on it. But if you just examine what the book is about and what are the references in the book and where it's coming from, you'll find a lamp for the path is one of the most common ones that appears by Atisha or Tsongkhapa. And that's the way to test the teacher. And one of the first things that you're being told in Tibetan Buddhism is to test the teacher. Because Buddhism is simply a constant testing of everything the teacher says. It is, it is not about like, you know, oh, a teacher said this, so I have to agree with him because that's out of respect. No. And in Tibetan Buddhism, they do actually say that you should really respect the teacher. They, should, you, they say that you should revere the teacher. They say you should think about the teacher like the Buddha. Like the enlightened Buddha is, is deep within, in some sense, the karmic manifestation in human form that is appearing before you as your teacher. Uh, but they are in some way potentially the enlightened Buddha. So you revere them like that, and, well, you would think, if I'm revering my teacher like that, maybe that will make a slave of me, that I'll just be sort of taking everything the teacher says because, oh, I revere the teacher. But no. They mean that by revering the teacher, by if you really respect the teacher, you actually question the teacher. You actually listen carefully to the ideas that your teacher is putting forward and then you go away and you test them. So let's say, let's say your, your teacher says uh, everything is impermanent. You know, all, all life is impermanent. You don't just say, all oh, right, that's it now, I know what Buddhism is. No. You go away and in your own life you examine this. Are things impermanent? Maybe, maybe they're not. Maybe they're permanent. Maybe this is all nonsense. Maybe impermanence is just a way of looking at things. Is everything. Like, I'm looking at this shelf in front of me, and it's an old shelf. And it's like made of, it's been there, you know, maybe a lifetime before I was born. Is that not permanent? Or what about Mount Erigel or Schlieveneren? Are they not per permanent? And you question everything the teacher says, and if you find that 
from your point of view, what the teacher says is true, then you follow that particular teaching. You make it your own by discovering within yourself the teaching. And you discover it by analysis, which is rational and logical. And that's not really the way that people think about religion. So sometimes when I say to people that, that I, I, I love to practice Buddhism and that it is a philosophy that means everything to me, and they look at me and they think, oh, yeah, you're into religion, are you? Uh, and they think like, well, that's old-fashioned. In fact, Buddhism is, is really the original psychotherapy. It, it's mind training training the mind like it was a muscle and examining things is a way of training your mind so the greatness of the author is given to show the teaching that has an immaculate source that's the first step that sense that you know these teachers are great from Atisha to Sankapa to the person that becomes your teacher they, they are great and they are linked together. One is coming out of the other. And they are using sources. One coming from the other. And those sources go back to Atisha and then back to the Buddha, to the sutras. The texts that come directly from the Buddha. In the 80 or 40 years that he was teaching, whatever. And that's the first step. And then... And then in the Lam Rim teachings, they go, the next step is like getting into kind of detail. So I'll read it here for you. Number two says how Atisha was born to one of the higher families. So this is a way that they start to open up uh, to meditate on the, on the original teacher that is the root of all these teachings, that the ones, you, you know, you're going to get teachings from somebody and the root of these is an original man, he's called Atisha. And so you meditate on him, and the first thing you think is, is like how he attained, you know, he was born to a high family. And he attained his good qualities in one single rebirth. And you meditate on the things he did to further the teachings after he gained his own good qualities. And you meditate on how he did all that good work in India and then how he did all that in Tibet. And that's the meditation on Atisha. And then you go on and it says you meditate on the greatness of the Dharma given to increase one's respect for the instruction. The greatness of allowing you to realize that all the teachings are without contradiction. The greatness of allowing all the scriptures to present themselves to you as instructions. So it's like the Dharma is a word. Dharma is a word that's used for the teachings. And the, the teachings are given to you to increase your respect for the instruction. It's like, it's like the teachings that come to you, the first thing you need to do with them is, is contemplate with awe how amazing it is that these teachings have actually come to you. You know, before you even think about what's in the teaching, it's like coming into a room that's a library. And before you even open the books, you say to yourself, isn't it wonderful we're here? Am I lucky to be here? So therefore, to summarize that little section, it's, it's thinking about the originator. Once you've thought about your teacher, once you've thought about the sources, the books that you're reading in, in philosophy, in, in Buddhism, and you make sure that they're mainstream. You make sure that they're coming from an impeccable source. Well, that source is going to be either Sankapa, and then going back behind Sankapa, it's going to be Atisha. 
So a tisha then you take is the, the, the real root of of these teachings, the Lam Rim teachings, the the beginning root of these in Tibet was Atisha writing the lamp for the path. And so you take that as the kind of real starting point of the river. And when you do that, you then begin to focus on Atisha himself. And how do you do this, by the way? Well, it's very simple. Either either you're, you know, if you had a, if you had a teacher like that you were face to face with, then that teacher would give you some books about the life of Atisha. Alternatively, you would go to the internet and you just Google Atisha and you'd find out a lot about him. Now, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for, very precisely, how he was born of a high noble family, how he attained good qualities in one single rebirth, and how he did things to further the doctrine. Once he, once he kind of had one single rebirth where he was, you know, born to a good family with good opportunities and good intelligence and and he developed realizations and he developed his own insight into the value of Buddhism. What did he do? He he started teaching it. He started, gosh, I must give this to other people. And he did that in India, you reflect on that. He did it in Tibet, you reflect on that. And now you're coming to the sense of like, well, wow, this, these teachings are really great, you know. These are big teachings. So the next step is, you say to yourself, well, am oh, I lucky I'm here? It's like, am oh, I I lucky I'm in the library? You say to yourself, well, if all these teachings have come from this guy called Atisha, who actually lived and did all this and wrote this book, and, and then that came down to Tsongkhapa, and then it came down to somebody who's actually, you know, on the internet with me or on email with me or whatever or I'm watching on YouTube I'm watching this guy on YouTube and he's not coming out of nowhere he's not like throwing out his own opinions he's not sort of a, having a big ego trip because he's trying to make a career in, in social media he's actually a Lama he's actually an ordained teacher he's he's the Dalai Lama or he's the Panshan Lama or he's somebody terribly important or she is uh Pema Chowden or, or some of the, the great noble and famous nuns, women, lamas that are teaching and there are many of them. So the, the first thing about being amazed with the teachings is like being, being amazed that they're available to you. And you don't read a book like it's any old book. When I pick up a, let's say, a Buddhist book. It's not like I'm picking up an ordinary book. It's like I'm picking up scriptures that have been handed down for centuries and that it's extraordinary that they were ever written and more extraordinary that they've survived and thirdly, extraordinary that I am lucky enough to be sitting here able to read it, that I have the health the eyesight, the energy, the intelligence. It's amazing to be here with this book, with these teachings. That's, that's the attitude. And so you think about how great it is that the Dharma is actually there, given to me, but you also think of the inherent value of these teachings. When you talk about Buddhist teachings, one of the qualities that you reflect on is that the teachings are without contradiction. And that's a kind of interesting point because ostensibly some of the Buddhist teachings seem to be different. So one sutra in Buddhism says one thing and sometimes you'd, you'd read another piece and it says a different thing I wouldn't have read any of these by the way, I'm only sharing with you what I would hear my teacher saying but even though they seem different people, teachers will explain to you that the reason why there's a sense of difference is because the Buddha Shakyamuni Buddha within history 500 years before the modern time two and a half thousand years ago, he taught 
for a long period of his life, 40 or 50 years, and he taught many different types of people, and he taught many different types of people at different stages in their life. So that's a whole lot of variations. And what you might say to a young person, let's say what I might say to a young person, is different than what I would say to a person in his 60s. Or the way that I would outline wisdom when I was a young person might have a different emphasis than what I would have when I'm in my 60s. But one of the things to hold on to when you're contemplating the teachings that you have not yet even opened the page of is the sense that they're all without contradiction, that whatever teaching there is in Buddhism, that they're all in some strange rational web of knowing. They're all inherently ordered around the singularity of truth. Now, another greatness of the teachings that is contemplated when you come to this stage to begin Buddhist study is the greatness of allowing all the scriptures to present themselves to you as instructions. So, when I take a Buddhist book, let's say I've just taken one now randomly off the shrine that's in front of me, and this book is called The Tibetan Book of the Dead. And you've often heard of it, you may have read it, and it's a very strange book. It's a very, very extraordinary book. Well, there's many people could read that book, and they wouldn't be taking it as instruction. They'd be taking it with a kind of curiosity. I'd love to know what's in it. And sometimes if you're reading it like that, you'd be exploring it. I'll say this for myself now. I'd sometimes read a book with a kind of a prurient curiosity. In other words, I might I might be looking for oddities in it or something weird in it or something extraordinary in it. When I was younger, I might take down a novel in the library and I'd flick through it, but I'd be looking for the kind of you know, the exciting sexual bits. The way we read is sometimes out of curiosity. And certainly that's a very good thing. Because that's how that's how we learn and evolve. But when you take down a Buddhist book, you don't read it dispassionately, you don't read it for curiosity, you don't read it because Oh, I'd be interested. Oh, I wonder what they believe. You don't you don't read it like eclectically. You know the way do you know the way like you'd be in a shop looking at sweets and jars? So you might think you might think that religion every religion was like a jar of sweets and you were kind of popping from one to the other to have a look. Oh, let's have a look at these. Or the way you might be at a wine tasting event and you'd be sipping a little this wine and that wine. Just for curiosity. I wonder, is that one spicy? Let me try it. That's curiosity. And it's something we do when we're wine tasting and something we do when we're shopping. Let's go into that other shop, see what's in that. That's the way we work. We become curious and we enjoy that. But, but this is different. And in this very early preliminary, before you actually get into the Buddhist stuff, in this preliminary, the advice from the teachers is always don't treat the scriptures with curiosity. The greatness of the teachings in the scriptures is that they present themselves to you as instructions. Everything in this book, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, is an instruction on how to live my life. And I will only read it line by line insofar as I can absorb it as an instruction. If you develop that relationship 
with Buddhist books. You could become, I think this is me talking, but you could become enlightened before you'd get to page five. And I, I do the opposite all the time myself. When I'm reading a, a, a book, a Tibetan Buddhist book, always the danger is I will flick through it and I'll be curious and I'll just be reading it like I might be reading some other interest in our commentary on modern 20th century philosophy. But to take it as an instruction that in some sense, this book, let's say I take this book, the Tibetan Book of the Dead was written, now I think it was written about, I think it was written about 800 years ago. I could be wrong here now. It was written an awful long time ago. And it vanished because the author of it buried it. And it was hidden. It was like buried and unknown for centuries. And then, probably quite recently, maybe in the last 200 years, although I'm not even sure of that, but certainly at some stage after being hidden for centuries, it reappeared. And then it survived down to the present day. And now there's many versions of it in, in print, and I have one in front of me. So that, that thing that I'm holding, you can hear it, there's the pages of it, that, that's a physical object, it's a book. And that book contains pages with writing and ideas. And those were written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And they contain intensely wise instructions about how to live a life. And if I just treat it like curiosity, then I'm losing I'm losing an awful lot of ground. I'm losing a lot of energy that opens my heart and mind to wisdom. But if I, if I treat it like this book is instructions for me in this life, then I'm on the right track. And there's one little thing my teacher once pointed out to me. To help that, and this was 25 years ago or so. And he said, you know, a, a book of Tibetan Buddhist teachings, you never leave on the ground, ever. You never leave on the floor. And you never put anything on top of it that's not a Buddhist book. And you never kind of throw it around casually on the desk. So that, that to me was like a physical Tai Chi that reflected a sense of reverence for Buddhist books. And I followed that for all those years. And it has consequences. It kind of intensifies the respect you have in your mind for the ideas that are in the book. It becomes like the interaction between the book and, and my mind is at a higher level of intensity than any other type of book I might take up. Even wonderful books of literature. I still don't treat them with the same reverence. In that sense, I suppose I use it as a sacred scripture. But it's, it's, it's those precise attitudes to it like that, that it contains all the teachings and that none of those teachings are contradictory and that all those teachings are magnificent because they benefit me and all those teachings I must take not out of curiosity but like as instructions. These are for my life. Now the best English word I could use for all that is reverence. So it teaches me reverence about the book. And then that has another beautiful consequence. The reverence for the book develops in me the facility to experience something as reverent or with reverence. And that means, and I noticed this because I went through a period in life before I was 
studying Buddhism, I went through a period where I was seven or eight years. I was living a very secular life. And I remember I was in I was living in Dublin and at one stage I was in Renly. I was staying with Tom McIntyre because I had nowhere else to stay at the time and he was very generous. He was a playwright and he was a mentor in a whole lot of ways to me. And I was in his house and I'd look out the window where I was working and it just happened to be across the road from a church, a Catholic church on Beachfield Avenue. And I used to look out and I'd have a kind of a nostalgia because I had left the church and I'd have a longing and then some days maybe I'd be passing the church and I'd go in. But I wouldn't experience any reverence. I would see the red sanctuary lamp, but I would look at it clinically like like one of the modern scientists you'd see on television, like an anthropologist exploring a cultural artefact. Red sanctuary lamp used to signify whatever, but it didn't, and so I didn't experience any real presence. I didn't experience any sense of awe of the beloved, the manifestation of God in the universe. didn't experience it for those years because I had become alienated. I'd become cut off. I, I had cut myself off from the institutional church, but, but in my heart, I suppose my heart was broken. And it took me a long journey to find my way back to being able to open the door of a church and, and instinctively experience a sense of awe and reverence for God's presence. It doesn't come naturally. In a Christian church, or I'm sure in a mosque, or any other building, synagogue or whatever, temple, awe and reverence that, that kind of is, is generated within the architecture of a church doesn't come naturally. There are certain things you need to do and practice to kind of generate that sense, that disposition, so that the architecture will then eventually trigger you automatically into a state of reverence. And that's a beautiful thing, because, because when you get to that stage, you then begin to use churches like an oasis. You know, you, you're in the busy street, and you're stressed, and and you see a church and you walk in and, and you're able to just be still for five minutes and, and experience a beautiful sense of tranquility and awe and transcendence reaching out to you. But it doesn't come naturally. It, it, it needs practice. And I found that the idea of the book and how you treated a book within Buddhism, which I was taught by my teacher, and then I practiced it. And, and you know, it really works very quickly. It takes about two days. If you have, if you choose a particular book, let's say this evening, and you say that now is a sacred book, it might be a Bible, and you'd be amazed where you've left the Bible, in an old drawer or maybe on the floor or in a, in a, you know, in a, in a bookcase with a whole lot of other books. But imagine if you said to yourself, well, that book now I'm going to treat as a kind of a sacred book. And the reason you treat it as a sacred book is that that book has instructions in it for you, that, that there are things in that that you can take as instructions to live your life wisely. Okay. So there you go. You pick a book. It happens to be in your house. happens to be by the Dalai Lama. And you say, okay, I will treat that book now with that kind of practice. So you'll find somewhere really special to put that book with nothing else beside it and, and you'll be aware it's there and, and, and that's it. And if you take it down to read it, you'll, you'll never put it on the floor, you'll, you'll never throw it casually on the sofa, you'll never put it sitting underneath the television. You know, you, you just always, after a couple of days, supposing you were reading it for each day for an hour or two, after a couple of days or a week, 
that book will have taken on an amazing kind of feng shui energy, a kind of a psychic energy. It will become charged with a sense of the sacred by virtue of the fact that you've practiced that way. And then the disposition to encounter something as sacred will begin to translate. So you'll find yourself in other circumstances treating something as sacred as well. And it seems to me that that in this whole preliminary, what we're doing tonight is this preliminary reflection on stuff before we begin the real nitty-gritty of Buddhist thought. And these preliminaries, they have a beneficial effect on your whole life. It's like if you never did any, if you never even got to the teachings and you just studied the preliminaries, you could you could become enlightened. I think, you know, there is actually a funny story of supposedly one of the famous monks in Buddhist practice. I forget who he was, he, some famous guy anyway, and he has a servant. And so the the great big monk Lama has his library and his servant makes him the tea and gets him out of bed and then when your man is meditating and reading all his philosophy books the poor servant is just sweeping the floor. And one day the servant is looking at one of the books and the teacher says, No, 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 no. No, no, don't be re no, it's not for you. You just sweep the floor. You're, you're poor. You're not worthy to be studying the Dharma. The Dharma is the word they use for, for the teachings. And that's it. That's the story. Except that at the end of the story, the, the commentator says that the servant had reached enlightenment by the end of his life. Of course. I just sweep the floor with reverence for the Master, who is the Great Lama. The Great Lama develops hubris and pride, and he ain't going to get to enlightenment in this lifetime. The other guy, the servant, surrendering each day simply with a sense of reverence that I am cleaning the space for these holy books reside. I'm, I'm dusting off all these old library books with the, with the reverence he reached enlightenment. And that's, that's one of the big, big preliminaries that we're thinking about in this evening is the sense of how do you begin in Buddhism? And the answer is that it's not actually with ideas and it's certainly not with rev revelation, with, with an idea that, you know, there's some sort of God going to come at you and, and you're going to mysteriously read something that will change your life. No, it's not like that. It's about analysis and it's about using your reason. And so it's finding a good teacher. Now, you may be able to find one, like you go to somewhere like Champaling, or you may have loads of other places you can go, or you may not be able to do that. And it may be on the internet that you get your first experience when you find a good teacher, and then you realize that there are hours of, of stuff on the internet. Or it might be in a book. I mean, to be very honest, the optimum and the way that Buddhists would really advise is probably the best by far, and that is you get a real teacher. And that real teacher is a mainstream, mainline teacher who is part of the great tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And that, that teacher can show their lineage back but also that 
whatever they are teaching is also a text that is related to previous texts that go back to people like Tsongkhapa or people like Atisha. That you're getting the real thing. And then when you get a book of Buddhist teachings, you treat it with reverence. You treat it with with a sense that that is carrying the Dharma. It's carrying wisdom that does not contradict itself, wisdom that will benefit you, and will, wisdom that in every sentence of it is going to be an instruction for your life. I used to have Buddhist books, and I would be afraid to read them. And that wasn't a negative thing. That was a very positive way of practicing Buddhism, because, like, I wouldn't take down the book and read it if I wasn't ready to study it. There's no point in reading Buddhist books for curiosity. You'd be better to study, you know, biology or quantum physics or life in Hollywood or how to make movies. They're, they're good things to be curious about. And I'm curious about how to make movies and how to make videos. And I'm always fiddling with Google to find out all those things. But I wouldn't do the same with Buddhism. Every so often, if I get a kind of a, a curiosity for Buddhism in my life, I always just try and pick some particular particular thing and go and find it and learn it. So, that's it. I know this has been a difficult... This has been a lecture. I don't really lecture but I feel that there's a good few people who really want me to share some of this stuff. And so I'm sharing it like a spiritual friend, like somebody who's, you know, I'm sharing these things because this is what my experience has been from a teacher. And, and all of this is not worth anything compared to the moment where you become stale you find yourself present in your own body. You find yourself present in the cosmos, in the room, in the space, where you are. You find yourself present among the people that love you. You call to mind all the people that don't like you or that you dislike deeply. And you bring them into your circle. And you bring into your circle all the strangers, all the people that... You don't know, but, but they're human and you share with people you love and with people you detest and with strangers. The, the whole lot of them together you share in that circle because in human life is the only realm in which awareness of suffering can lead to the motivation to be free from suffering. And that's what Buddhism is going to be. That's our next step to examine that, to examine what is the nature of being here? How is it suffering? And where is the liberation from it? So that's what we'll go on to in the third of these little talks from the little Buddha corner of my shed studio in the hills above Loch Allen. Thank you for being here. Have a beautiful weekend.